Hello everyone, thanks for having us here today to talk about living well your way. It's a bit funny for me to have a microphone, I have the world's loudest voice, so you'll have to tell me if I'm yelling at you. Um, but living well your way, ooh, I gotta figure out how to do the slides, that's the next thing, there we go. So. Um, Living Well Your Way is a joint Murrumbidgee Local Health District and Primary Health Network uh, project, and it's a collaborative commissioning initiative that aims to um, improve the lives of people in the Murrumbidgee living with chronic disease. So we're really excited to tell you about it. Um, throughout the presentation, you're gonna hear us talking about two chronic diseases specifically, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which is a lung condition, um, and heart failure. And that's because those are two conditions that have been chosen as the um, places to start where we're focusing to begin with. We are hoping that over time we can expand to include other chronic diseases. So um, I want to start by just introducing ourselves. So uh, a very brief introduction there, but I'm Caroline Holtby, so I'm the program director for Living Well Your Way, and I work across both organizations, the local health district and the primary health network. And then I'll introduce um, Sue Massey, who's just over there, um, who's the senior lead for the Murrumbidgee Local Health District. And then we have Mel Reeves here, who's the senior project officer for the primary health network. So we're all going to do the presentation a little bit together. Um, so you get to hear from all of us. Um, as oh yeah, we, um, we just want to make sure that we also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land um, and pay our respects to elders past, present, and emerging. Um, and uh, I'll hand over to Sue. Hi everyone. Living well your way in the Murrumbidgee is really about expanding and enhancing people's wellness. As we talked about earlier today, it's so true, people with chronic disease can still live a meaningful, fulfilling life. So our vision is for people with heart failure and or COPD in our community, no matter where they live, it doesn't matter. They should be able to have the best quality of life that they can. And that means to be able to access care, you know, when they, where they, um, from, you know, from personal, professional and community resources, you know, that they need, when they need them and where they choose to, um, to have their care. Um, the objectives are essentially, in a, in a nutshell, is really to improve people's way of life um, and, and reduce the demand for hospital services. We know that care is best for these chronic conditions in the community as opposed to hospital. Uh, and obviously reduce avoidable mortality. So now that you know a little bit of the vision of what Living Well Your Way is in our region in the Murrumbidgee, I just wanted to touch on what the broader health system reform is that this program feeds into. So um, Living Well Your Way is called a collaborative commissioning initiative. It's funded by New South Wales Health. And what it is is meant to be an accelerator. So something that drives change towards value-based healthcare. And you might have heard those words value-based healthcare before. What's that? Um, and you, many of you might know that historically we've always measured healthcare in terms of numbers. How many people get sick, how many surgeries we do, how many hospital beds we have. It's always about numbers, but what this shift to value is, is trying to figure out what are the outcomes that matter to our communities and to our patients. So what's, how are we helping to improve quality of life? Do people have access to the services that they need when they need them? Um, and are they living as well as they can given if they are um, sick? or have a chronic disease. Um, from a system perspective, we're also looking at our use of resources and are we efficiently and effectively using those resources? And that's what this program is designed to do. So you're probably wondering how we um, decided to focus on COPD and, and heart failure. So we followed data um, and we have some of the highest rates in New South Wales and Australia when it comes to chronic disease and potential hospital, um, preventable hospitalisation. So um, just for an example, COPD um, has the highest hospitalisation rate in New South Wales in our region. So pretty alarming facts that um, are at our doorstep that we're trying to streamline and, and improve pathways for. We also have um, some data around Aboriginal people and Aboriginal people in our region um, approximately die 20 years younger than the total population, so looking to close the gap with our pathway as well. So meet Wendy. 
She's the person who we'd like to showcase, we'd like to tell her story. Wendy was feeling sick for some time leading up to her diagnosis of COPD and heart failure back in 20, 2015 and 2016. She was in and out of hospital a lot, not knowing what was wrong. She was finally diagnosed in hospital, not out of hospital, in hospital during one of her visits um, and subsequently was referred to a series of different health professionals for the following year or so uh, to help stabilise you know, her chronic comorbidities uh, such as diabetes and fluid overload and shortness of breath, things like that. So she was seeing people in the community not quite connecting the dots, not quite understanding why. And as you can see, still coming into hospital, still presenting to emergency, uh, quite, fre quite frequently. This all came up to a point in early 2018 where she was contacted by a respiratory service. She was talking to a respiratory nurse um, via phone. She was able to connect with that person and she was connected into a respiratory um, rehab program where she started to learn tools on how to manage her own illness um, and have an action plan and understand what to do in the situation where her symptoms get worse. She was also linked into her regular GP, so she would go and see the GP in conjunction with the respiratory nurse and work together to keep her action plan in place. And really from about March of 2018 to uh, really the end of 2019, she didn't have any admissions at all or any presentations to hospital, which was fantastic for her. Uh, she acknowledged that that was at that, that point, she sort of the penny dropped, she understood her disease process a lot more. Um, and she had a bit more control over it. And then in the end of, uh, in 2019, uh, sort of the end of, sorry, 2020, she had a couple of planned hospital admissions where her GP uh, decided she was getting sick and would pop her into hospital for treatment where she needed to be. But it was all uh, not an emergency response. It was all planned and coordinated. So I suppose the key messages that I wanted to put forward with Wendy is that, you know, Really, diagnosis for, for Wendy was done a little bit too late and it was done in a hospital setting. We, we really don't need to be uh, waiting until it gets to that point. We'd like to be able to push that back a little bit. Uh, also, it seems that, you know, despite numerous different health professionals intervening with Wendy, it just seemed that there was a disconnect. There wasn't that sense of communication and flow between the health professionals and she still kept bouncing into ED with really no idea what was going on. Uh, and, and also, you know, at the point where she did have that, that the, the, the connection with the, the pulmonary rehab, the, the education, the understanding of her disease process, she was able to then take management of her own condition. And between her, the hot, the, her GP, she was able to come, and, and as we know, people do get sick with chronic illness, so she was able to come into hospital in a really planned and coordinated manner. She knew she may need some... Uh, on, antibiotics or additional oxygen, she was able to come in for the proper support then. So it was a completely different um, picture. Uh, and as, as soon as her uh, primary health uh, management plan was activated and, and realised, she was able to stay well in the community. Oh my, stop talking, sorry. The pathway, this is what we've ended up with um, from a lot of co-design with our, with our communities. Uh, clinicians, um, people with lived experience uh, in our communities, we've, we've developed a pathway, I suppose, and it, it's quite simplified here in its diagram, but there's so many components to it, and it personifies a patient's whole journey, not just the one that they would have in the hospital or, or outside of the hospital. So as we know, it's, it's the whole journey. We know that a person can also enter the pathway at any, at any point in their journey, but for the sake of going through it, I'll start at 12 o'clock and move my way around. Prevention, screening and intervention is all around, you know, making connections with people who have risk factors for heart disease and COPD. And it's also about um, identifying their, their symptoms and knowing what, you know, a timely response to them and, and what to do about it. So it involves things like opportunistic screening and primary health. It involves promote health promotional campaigns. And some of the things that we're going to put into place are uh, formalised partnerships between pharmacists, for instance, uh, primary, health net people, uh, primary health services and GPs, so that people are linked into the GP a lot earlier. 
Uh, we're also looking at upskilling uh, the primary health service um, health professionals to, um, to be able to detect um, signs of disease and be able to make those referrals. Um, we're also um, engaging with primary health services such as the Aboriginal Medical Health Service to uh, undergo edu um, education and, and um, you know, screening procedures with, with people and uh, generally um, upskilling health professionals across the course in that. Uh, the early diagnosis is really around uh, improving the access for people to, to see a specialist and get the test so that they actually find out what's wrong with them. And we want to do that earlier rather than later. And we want to do that in primary health and with specialists outside of the hospitals. It's where it really needs to be pushed back. Uh, so this is really around, uh, you know, things like upskilling our GPs and improving their level of confidence with, with making a diagnosis. Uh, this is particularly so in heart failure. Uh, they have uh, a trepidation around making that diagnosis and of course we know that as soon as we have a diagnosis we're more likely to know how to treat it and how to manage it and somebody will get on the right uh, path to wellness once it's diagnosed. Uh, it's also around um, creating, um, enhancing our, our access to specialists. So that might look like um, improvement in GP and specialist relationships, whether that's formal or informal, the way it's all planned, uh, that care coordination, uh, and, uh, and just, just generally people's access. So we know that people who are outside of Wagga and Griffith, you know, they, they do have that, um, the distance, the tyranny of distance to travel. So what we are trying to, to do is enhance our outreach diagnostic centres so that people who are out at Hay and Lake Cajelico have got access to a visiting cardiologist, for instance. Uh, we're looking at um, in, you know, uh, creating uh, cardiology um, networks where we have uh, somebody may have an echo or a heart test and in real time a cardiologist can see it, even in Sydney, and make that make that diagnosis. So we're, we're looking at really innovative ways of getting people connected to specialist care very, very in a timely manner. Um, this is all to keep people well and optimally well in the community. So this really looks like, what this looks like is, is people who have, uh, they have understand, like Wendy, she understands her care, she understands her management, she has a plan. So she has a plan of what to do if things go wrong, if her symptoms increase. Uh, and, and she'll know what to do. So it's around um, a couple of things really in, in, in this sense would be to, you know, enable GPs or, or help them to, to coordinate chronic care a little bit in, a, in more of a, a tangible way that they can manage that. People who come in for chronic care rather than, um, you know, a one-off one basis, so they're taking that, that long-term look at their care, but we're also trying to enhance people's, uh, people to be partners in their care. So we want to be able to have people, consumers who actually um, understand their care and actually are at the table and having that discussion and, and have that level of, of health literacy to understand what to do. Um, but we do know that these people get sick. So we, we want to, as I mentioned before, have that proactive coordinated treatment so that we, we want alternatives to emergency. We, we want to create an alternative path for people to seek rather than just going to the ED. It's quite a helpless, hopeless situation we don't want to have for people. So um, ways around that, uh, we're, we're looking at um, after hours GP services in some centres, we're looking at a rapid access clinic in some centres and an expansion of the hospital and the home. Uh, we're also looking at a district-wide on-call service where people who are known to the to the service can have somebody to call just to de-escalate them and to talk them through their action plan um, and also we're looking at obviously at more planned admissions where GPs and, and specialists are actually proactively planning somebody's exacerbation or their when they do become unwell and pop them into hospital when needed. And when people do go to hospital, we want to make sure that they go home supported. And that's really important to us, in, in particularly a, um, a, a passion of mine, is to make people feel supported when they go home. So, for instance, you know, 
we not only want to give them the tools and the information that they need to succeed, but we also need to identify what social barriers they have to overcome to go home and stay well in the community. We need to reconnect them with their community and um, it's not just a case of sending them home and hoping for the best. We need to know what, what barriers they have. Once somebody is well, we want to restore their function. So that's all around enhancing our, our current pulmonary rehabilitation programs. Uh, so that, what that looks like is expanding it to include heart failure as well, so that they have an understanding of, uh, people with heart failure understand how to manage their fluid, how to weigh themselves, what happens when they get short of breath. Uh, and this is a multidisciplinary approach. So it's not just a nurse, it's a physio, it's a dietitian, it's a, social, it's a social worker perhaps, or somebody to help them with their social circumstances. It's a speech pathologist, it's a range of different people to help them get connected back into the community. With, with then the next link would be a community-based exercise program that's ongoing, so it's a social conduit for them to feel connected back into their community. Um, for, for instance, walking groups and, and gyms and things like that. So that's the pathway. I could talk about it all day. Um, but essentially, like I said before, somebody could enter the pathway at any time. Um, surrounding the pathway is also a navigational support tool or tools that we've come up with. And one of them is uh, a, a, like a, a digital app people can have on their phone, which helps them identify what's the next step in their journey. Uh, it also is a brilliant way of them being able to take that to their GP and saying, uh, my nurse Suze wants me to do X, Y, Z, um, wants you to consider A, B and C, and then they have the power to take that to their GP and communicate that that action needs to be done for their, for their health. So that's a really good way to navigate. We're also looking at upskilling our health professionals across the board to know that every step in the process needs to be um, warmly handed over to the next step in the process so that everybody knows what is going on. Um, people aren't just blindly going from one, where, where do I go to next, what happens next? So there are a couple of the things that um, I wanted to talk about and, um, and just everybody, hopefully the, the, the aim of the game is that everybody stays uh, well in the community and lives their best quality of life. Thanks. Thanks, Sue. Um, so what makes us different? Our team is a part of the LHD and the PHN and I think that gives us a really good insight to primary and acute care. Um, we work with teams within both organisations so we're really talking to who's on the ground and, and getting their feedback as how to move forward. Um, one of the key things that we did last year was a huge co-design. It went over a course of a week. Um, we had 120 local people um, they included health professionals, they included community, they included some of our peak bodies, um, university, um, some of the larger lung foundation and heart foundation organisations as well. Um, we're always listening to our stakeholders and wanting to improve what we're working on as well. So as Sue mentioned, our pathway, our whole pathway is aimed at improving and empowering the patient or the carer or the family of the patient. Um, so I, just a few other things that make us a little bit different. Um, you heard a lot from Sue there about all the things that we're trying to change or improve when it comes to a pathway of care for someone with chronic disease. And it sounds like a lot of new things. And there are a few new things. Um, part of what collaborative commissioning does is it looks at what's already out there, what already works in the Murrumbidgee, and where are there gaps. So some of the things she highlighted are gaps that we're trying to, uh, to fill. So, um, you know, after our support, Support is a known gap in our area that we, we would like to kind of bulk that up or do work in. Access to specialists is a known gap that we're trying um, to fill. But there's also a lot of these services that already exist. And what we're doing is we're working with those local teams, our workforce, really trying to optimize what they're already doing, um, making sure that it matches back best practice and that people are working to the top of their scope and really feel, feel fulfilled in their role. So um, it's about not only filling those gaps with new things but also optimizing what's already there and helping our teams to work together. And because we're working across primary and acute care, 
We can see things from a lens that covers the whole system or for the patient from the beginning of their diagnosis all the way through um, to when they're not doing so well anymore because we're looking at the system as a whole. So that's what's unique about, about this. When we talk about next steps, um, so we've been working on this for a year so far, so we're really lucky that we've had that much time to do real, um, really detailed work in terms of planning, understanding what the community needs and wants, um, and then really trying to understand what are the costs of a program like this and what are the benefits. So we've been doing a lot of work on that. Um, but very soon, um, coming up in July, so the new financial year, we'll be switching from planning to actually doing. So we'll be engaging our pharmacies to work with us in that early screening um, and to be able to help people when they are feeling unwell. We'll be working with our GPs to see how can they um, implement quality improvement in chronic disease management. Working with the local health districts, what models of care are new and how can we support you to really work towards the top of your scope. Um, and then also non-governmental organizations. So we have quite a few organizations that are funded through the PHN that provide work and do a lot of work already with people with complex chronic disease. So um, helping them also to look at what outcomes are we achieving and are they consistent across the whole system. Um, so we'll be doing that. We're very excited to start registering patients, have real patients, um, and, uh, and see these systems start to work and then to measure the outcomes that matter like I talked about at the start. Um, one thing that we didn't highlight as well as we could have is, um, uh, is the role of communities and the role of LHACs in this. So um, when we talked about doing our co-design, there was quite a few LHAC members who were participating in our co-design and have worked with us as, as community members and consumer representatives. Some people who happen to have chronic disease and be on an LHAC have been working with us um, and we want to, that to definitely to continue. Part of that pathway is about how living optimally in the community and happiness, as is the theme, um, involves, you know, to be healthy, to be well involved, is, requires involvement in the community. So that's what we want to continue to promote, and especially at that area where we're looking at people who are feeling as well as they can, they're managing their chronic disease, how can we help them to stay engaged in community groups that are already existing um, and to those social ties in the community that help them really feel like they're optimized in life. Um, so that's kind of our call out to you. If your LHAC has an interest in promoting these cr community groups or working with us in more detail in terms of how we can promote the management of chronic disease in your local town, in your local community, because this is a local project, um, please get in touch. Um, we're really working on that now and trying to build that very strongly into the pathway. So um, that's another next step that we've got.